After weeks of anticipation, the United States has finished reviewing and setting its policy on North Korea that will guide the Biden administration's engagement with the Kim Jong-un regime and their talks on denuclearization. And the key word here is practical. The White House says it will avoid past policies that failed in engaging with the North to take a calibrated practical approach that will also consider diplomacy for practical progress. What does this mean? And responding to this announcement, why is North Korea so unhappy? For this, we're joined by Sue Kim, policy analyst at RAND Corporation, who formerly worked as a CIA analyst. We also connect with John Delury, professor at Yonsei University's Graduate School of International Studies. Lovely to have you both back. And well, we have, we have this policy review to unpick today. And well, ladies first. So why don't we start with you, Sue? Now, White House Press Secretary uh, Jen Psaki said that the US isn't going to focus on getting a grand bargain or um, a follow strategic patience, but it's going to take this practical, calibrated approach. And, even explore diplomacy. What does this all mean? And uh, what kind of options do you think that the administration is considering at this point? Sure. So I think the hope is that um, the administration has registered the lessons learned um, from the previous administration's handling of the North Korea issue. But I think the first thing is that um, we well, can't really bargain with the North Koreans. Um, any ambition to, to strike a sweeping deal what the regime is going to reflect um, com complete in, uh, misunderstanding or um, incomplete understanding um, of the complexity of the North Korea problem. Um, not to mention, it also um, underestimates uh, Kim's negotiating prowess. So another US administration seeking to strike a deal with the United States, or sorry, with, with North Korea, um, especially after the past four years, uh, would suggest to me um, an amateur understanding of the, the, the problems of dealing with North Korea. Um, but the, the statement also alluded to um, patience, um, which I think is also both dormant and also a weakness, a, a dormant strength and a weakness. Uh, so depending on how you funnel this patience, it's a strength when the United States chooses to refrain from reacting to every provocation, um, but also it could be a weakness when um, we don't communicate and demonstrate to Kim Jong-un uh, the costs of his nuclear provocations. Um, it's also a weakness, I think, if we don't really speak out um, and expose the wrongdoings of the regime. So I think the administration could go, you know, it, it does have options. Um, and it's important to remember that um, the, the administration is actually aware of the tools um, at its disposal and um, actually deliberates on what the best combination is to, to use these tools. And John, I'd love to hear your views on this as well. What exactly do you think Washington is calibrating as a practical approach? Well, I think that our expectations, frankly, were pretty low of the review. A review is backward looking, you know, so they've been looking mostly at the last four administrations, and it's no surprise their conclusion was nothing worked. We, we sort of know that uh, based sheerly on the nuclear missile capabilities that North Korea has developed and has um, in its possession at its fingertips. So it was no surprise. Um, they didn't announce the results of the review with a lot of fanfare. Um, and again, a review is mostly backward looking. So the question, Su Young, as you pose it, is where do they go from here? And um, I mean, we're not actually reading the review. Uh, we are working off of media briefings and leaks and statements by the um, by the press spokesperson. The Washington Post wrote up probably the fullest account of the details of the review. And again, it's really hints. Um, there is a stress more on diplomacy than sanctions and coercion um, compared with the previous signals from the administration. This is a bit more forward leaning in terms of need to be practical is often a euphemism for talking to the North Koreans and making deals that are maybe good, uh, certainly not perfect. As Sue said, there are no perfect answers here and solutions here. So um, the signals that I'm hearing from the way in which the review has been initially briefed um, are that the administration wants to get back into dialogue. Uh, significantly, there was also affirmation by an anonymous senior uh, administration official affirmation of the Singapore statement, which is actually quite new. And there's been a lot of debate whether to affirm Singapore 
a signature Donald Trump maneuver uh, or to sort of pretend it didn't happen. And uh, the North Koreans are paying attention to that here in South Korea. There's a lot of attention to that. So that is potentially a significant step forward is that the administration is going to work on the framework established in Singapore. Uh, and that would at least that doesn't solve anything, but that will make it a little bit easier to get into the initial uh, dialogue with Pyongyang. And John, well, North Korea, upon hearing about this policy review, the regime wasn't happy at all and it called it hostile and uh, even threatened to exact measures that would amount to a crisis beyond control for the US. Uh, I think the COVID-19 pandemic might have stolen their thunder, but why is North Korea so dissatisfied by this? And uh, what do you think they were hoping to see from the US policy review? Well, I have a slightly different interpretation of those statements. Uh, in the North Korean media hierarchy, uh, they were pretty low-level statements and actually subdued, r rather like the policy review itself was rolled out without a lot of fanfare. Uh, these were not, you know, we know what North Korea is like in verbally and also in, in actions when they're really upset and want attention. And uh, the, the sort of threatening aspect of those statements was quite vague, whereas their, their threats can be very specific and we pay more attention when they're specific. So these were these were generalized. If the administration continues with this kind of hostile policy, then we will, you know, give them reason to not sleep at night. Uh, that that order. So no, there there's no reason they should be excited about uh, the initial results of the review. There's not sort of golden prize in there or particularly warm uh, opening. Um, but I, again, they've left themselves a lot of room. We'll have to see, I would expect, potentially higher level, um, uh, more senior figures weighing in. Uh, but I think they are also, again, waiting a bit to see what's the real meat behind this. You know, I'm, I'm thinking here it's May, it's early May, and many of very good North Korea experts um, were expecting major strategic provocations by North Korea all the way back in, in October. So um, we can debate how to interpret that. Uh, but in, in effect, that has left the administration a lot of room uh, to do different things. And so I, again, I think North Korea may continue to wait. The next big event, of course, is President Moon's visit to Washington. Well, Sue, so North Korea, of course, uh, makes quite a lot of threats. And while you've said that the COVID-19 pandemic and the domestic turmoil right now in North Korea, it's not going to curb Kim Jong-un's nuclear ambition. And North Korea, of course, reacted very ang quite angrily to this policy review. What kind of actions do you think North Korea could possibly take in the coming weeks or months to really stage their protest? And what do you think they're hoping to get? Sure. So I think we've already seen the regime actually acting out um, even before we saw these statements or the the, uh, the North Korea policy review being completed, being announced. Um, so it's not anything surprising, I would say, to see the North Korean reaction. And um, I know that the the quantity of the reports that we saw over the weekend, um, especially noting the the acknowledgement of the policy review. I think that was notable, but I don't think that the, the reaction that we're seeing from North Korea is anything um, that is either, you know, uh, you know, aberration or abnormal, um, you know, typical of North Korea to do. Um, so, you know, it, it's just going to go all go along with the rhetoric, um, and and Kim is going to stay true to what he said and keep his promise. Um, you know, going to test and show off greater and more advanced missile and you know weapons capabilities, um, gradually climbing up the escalation ladder, of course, and until it reaches a point, I think, when um, the United States decides to, or probably won't decide, but at least um, will show that it's going to flinch. Um, that, I think, is going to open the path toward you know, some kind of engagement, Pyongyang style. But again, um, as Dr. Delory alluded to this, um, we don't really know, um, you know what specific outlines or you know, specificities to the policy review has, has really been announced. But I think at best we can say that um, the, 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 the new administration is not going to be reverting to the path that we've seen in the past four years. Um, and I think that um, the North Koreans are probably not going to, um, you know, they're not going to want to, I guess, spoil any opportunities to, to 
further push the United States force, but also to, to see if there's an opportunity to extract more concessions and to continue to assert um, its, its status as a nuclear weapons holding power. And Sue, so the U.S. Uh, said that its ultimate goal is the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula instead of saying North Korea's denuclearization. What do you make of this wording? Do you think it's going to help reassure North Korea or do you think there's a danger of emboldening its, its resolve to get U.S. troops off the Korean Peninsula, for instance? Sure. So, you know, the admission of North Korea and, and the phraseology I thought was notable um, you know, typically the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, it connotes this eventual termination of um, the U.S. ROK alliance, um, removing U.S. troops from the Korean Peninsula. So the term encompasses um, this follow through um, from Seoul and Washington, while on the other hand, um, North Korea, of course, um, its own compliance is unlikely to be accounted for. So, you know, I don't think the regime is going to need an external impetus to, to embolden its resolve. I think the resolve has already been there. Um, any U.S. action or inaction, I think, can also serve as justification for Kim um, in pursuit of his nuclear weapons and, and other provocations. So, you know, and, and this is because, of course, the regime has already seen or has yet to see um, the, the, the measures um, from the United States and the international community that's going to um, veritably rein in um, Kim's nuclear ambitions. Well, so the words are out there. The U.S. is looking to take a practical approach. And, well, the question is how it's going to do so. And, John, back in 2017, you emphasized the need to design a security guarantee package for real progress to actually be made. Do you still hold that view? And what do you think would be the practical starting point for progress to take place? Well, I, I still hold that view to the extent um, that the core of this issue is a security dilemma in which North Korea, for good reason, feels threatened in its neighborhood. Um, and, you know, at, at root, the thing that we're most concerned about, or certainly the United States is most concerned about, the nuclear deterrent is a deterrent. It's an effective deterrent, and that's its rationale. Uh, is to defend the national security and the security of the DPRK and the uh, security of the of the Kim regime and the Korean Workers Party. So the root of this is a uh, is North Korean insecurity, and they've kind of solved that problem with a nuclear deterrent. And therefore, if we are serious about denuclearization, we have to substitute an equal or better sense of security on the part of the North Korean leadership that they genuinely are. Uh, both safer and uh, it's easier to make the argument they can be more prosperous, but it's harder to make the argument that they are safer as a regime without that nuclear deterrent. And so, um, yes, I'm still of the view that you have to address the security elements. Um, I think that simply offering sanctions relief is insufficient, although that's obviously part of a, of a path forward. Uh, but you're going to have to, the United States and South Korea are the key uh, partners. And then considering Japan's security as well, you're going to have to, um, you know, change the architecture of the region and change the political relationships in a way that North Korea does not feel threatened. And so that means things that we don't like to talk about, uh, like the joint military exercises, um, like the uh, force presence of USFK uh, in South Korea, it doesn't automatically mean getting rid of all joint exercises or automatically mean getting rid of all U.S. forces from South Korea, but it means fundamentally changing the way that North Korea sees those pieces on the chessboard. And that is very, very difficult work, but I'm afraid it will have to be addressed insofar as we're serious uh, about making progress toward ultimate denuclearization. So really making North Korea feel that it no longer needs uh, nuclear weapons for its security. And Sue, how do you think, feel about this? From your perspective, what would be the practical starting point for discussions to begin and for real progress to happen? Sure. So I think the, the most practical starting point um, would be to formulate a policy that's really not swayed by pressures. Um, and that's, of course, you know, pressures from North Korea. Um, the provocations, the peace ploys, escalations, um, the threatening rhetoric. Of course, this this period of you know silence or submergence that I think makes us just as um, uneasy um, as would the regime's provocations. Um, but 
I also think that there are pressures that are self-imposed. You know, the need to settle on an agreement or engagement path with the North Koreans right away, um, that we need to take a risk to talk to the North Koreans, um, to, to, to hear them out essentially. But that I think in return, you have to get something back from the North Koreans to, to, to assure us that North Korea can also um, you know, stay true and, and, and fulfill its part of the pledge. Um, but you know, a bold and preemptive move to, to urgently move on to you know, some sort of a peace accord with the North Koreans. Um, this kind of mindset, I think, is only going to cloud our judgment and, and, and to um, you know, bring us back to um, what we've seen in, in previous administrations where um, we just keep letting the North Koreans make progress while we um, continue to have to, you know, to borrow the administration's term, you know, to, to, to calibrate and to recalibrate our position. So um, I want to, I guess, tell the, uh, the, the audience that, you know, dealing with the, the North Koreans, it's, it's not really like a last call for sales. Um, and, and I think this mindset um, would be especially endangering for an administration that's just starting out. Um, and then this could also set the path for, you know, another round of, of talks or negotiations that really aren't going to, um, you know, help us to, to reduce the North Korean nuclear threat and to address um, the, the number of other issues that pertain to the Kim regime. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, so we'll have to leave the interview here today. That was Sue Kim, policy analyst at RAND Corporation and former CIA analyst, and John DeLury, professor at Yonsei University's Graduate School of International Studies. Thank you both for your wonderful insights today. Thank you, Sia. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.